Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Raveki. I'm really, really excited about this. Um, th uh, this is my good friend, Johannes Niederhauser, and uh, uh, we have spoken so often together, uh, either the two of us or with other people like Daniel Zaruba. We almost always very quickly get into real dialogos, um, and we share a, a, a common vision about the practice of uh, philosophia uh, and, and the cultivation of wisdom and meaning. Um, I greatly admire Johannes. I admire his integrity. I admire the pathway that he's carving for himself, um, the authenticity by which he does this. Uh, many of you know that I, I'll comment on many of his videos and um, I got to spend time with Johannes February of this year at length in person. It was wonderful. So um, we're going to try and talk about Heidegger and one of the hardest things and yet one of the most central things at least to my mind to talk about in Heidegger but first I'm just going to welcome Johannes and just tell us a little bit again about yourself Johannes. Thank you very much John uh, it's a great honor to be here with you again and to speak and also to uh, John uh, briefly let me know the question he wants to get into so this could be a yeah uh, Pandora's box that we're going to open <clears throat> when it comes to Heidegger. Maybe just briefly on, on what I do. I wrote my PhD on on Martin Heidegger, on death and being. And it uh, turned out during the research that death resurfaces throughout his philosophical uh, life. He, because he wants to understand being in terms of finitude mm -hmm. and uh, time also in terms of finitude and uh, he sees death as absolutely i think central to and death is you know he sees death as related with language um and death related to concealment also um, which is his way of trying to overcome um the what derrida called the metaphysics of presence and what i've since been doing or for the last three years now, almost as I've been building my own um, online philosophy academy, and where we teach Heidegger and Hegel and early Greek philosophy and also uh, Japanese philosophy. And uh, John has been, uh, since the beginning, very supportive of the works. So I'd like to thank you also for mm -hmm. that. And I look forward to our dialogue. So Johannes has a course. Um... I really recommend it um, on Heidegger's being in time, and that's what we're going to concentrate uh, on. I'm not, yeah. um, I'm not, I'm not restricting us to it. We might reach out to other aspects of Heidegger later. Heidegger um, yeah. to try and uh, uh, so we're, what I'm saying is we're not just doing exegesis. Uh, we'll wrestle with a problem, and I, I will both probably dip outside of it. I want to at some point. Uh, this, um, but here's. Here's the first pass at the question, and even getting the question right is going to be something that we're going to probably uh, tumble around on. Um, and I invite everybody. We're like, when when you're with Heidegger, like he often described his project as like the way you wander through a woods, and there are different pathways, and they lead you, and they come in different directions, and they cross at different places, but there isn't a simple, straight, linear path. Um, and you may say, well, isn't he just confused? No, I mean, there is there is real reason, not in our modern sense, but in the Socratic Platonic sense, there's real reason why that is a good way uh, to try and wrestle with the questions he's wrestling with. So I'm asking people to get to frame it that way and follow us in that way. So here's an initial presentation. So being in time, obviously the book is about yeah. being and time, or else it's right, really mistitled. Um, and then Heidegger is making a, a core argument about um, how to do what he calls fundamental ontology, how to, how yeah. to, to, to get a, a, a deep understanding of being. Now, again, for him, this is not, even the word understanding isn't, you shouldn't hear it the way we typically hear it which is from the an analytic tradition. Okay, what he's going to do, he's going to lay out some definitions. He's going to escalate things. He's going to remove confusion and we'll have clarity. Yeah. That's not. What's going on with Heidegger is this 
hermeneutical, ph phenomenological. He's trying to get us to see, I think a better word is realize, uh, because of some of the critiques he makes of the visual metaphors, right? Uh, right To realize- To hear also. Yeah, yeah also to hear, to see, to realize um, being. And, and that um, unlike Husserl's phenomenology that is really oriented towards the transcendental ego, the, 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 yeah. the structures of consciousness, Heidegger mm -hmm. is focused on being. So first of all, is, is that a fair initial? I haven't even posed the yeah. question yet. I'm just saying that's what we're directed towards. Well, if you, yes, that's fair. And also if you say you haven't even posed the question, the being in time itself is the attempt to even begin to articulate the question. Yeah. Uh, of course, this is philosophia in in its purest form yeah. because philosophy, philosophy is always preparation yes and uh, re remains preparation i would say to a large degree and um i would just you know as i'm going i have been going through being in time again for the course maybe i should have mentioned this earlier um just if people want to enroll we begin with seminars for 10 weeks sometime uh, mid-january and so there will be links down below in the description etc but let me just say that the clear difference between and it is in between Husserl and Heidegger is precisely as you said uh, is that he moves complete he's already completely outside of subjectivity yes. or let's say the transcendental ego or transcendental I and that becomes clear in the introduction of to being in time in the absolutely crucial section seven which is on the method or the concept of phenomenology, mm -hmm. where he destructs, as it were, he takes apart the very word itself and looks at phenomenon and logos together and then yes. brings them back together. Yes. But he doesn't look at the genealogy of the concept. He actually explicitly says, I don't care you know, when it was developed by Christian Wolff yeah. Uh, and how it developed further and how Hegel used it, et cetera. No, I just, I'm just going to look at the foundational meaning of the words and then let that disclose something. And that is itself already a phenomenological exercise. Mm -hmm. So he brings and he's, and it's, and it's so razor sharp and it's extremely precise how he makes a distinction between, you know, phenomenon obviously means appearance or phenomenon, but not everything that appears is a phenomenon something that appears could just seem to be something. Um, and then what is a real phenomenon, but also what has become a real phenomenon so that introduces this sense of uh, temporality, but also uh, let's say a di dynamism really. Um, anything that you've grasped as a real phenomenon can also turn into a mere seeming yes. at the end. Yes. So, and what we're after uh, and, I, I, and I will give you the floor to pose the question, obviously. But what we're after is being and time, but absolutely not in any traditional sense. Yes. So we're not after permanence or substance or uh, timelessness. Or subject, or subject right? Uh, or subject, yes. Or yes, yes, exactly. To, yeah. So... I mean, this is important because, uh, I mean, Heider is actually also exemplifying part of his thesis is that all of these ways that we are traditionally talking and thinking about being have in some ways blinded us or made us fall away from a a, a, a genuine relationship with being. Um, and so I'm going to take that rejection of the tradition yeah. and, and sort of funnel it into the problematic that we're going to wrestle with here. So Heidegger, and each one of these things that I'm going to reject are are, are, are sort of genuses for, for ways in which people have made, have mistakenly or misapprehended being. Uh, so one is yeah. to think of that what we're talking about, we're talking about being is we're talking about things in the sense of individual beings. And either right or sets of them, or, or or even the universe as a set of entities, and then yeah, what yeah. Heidegger wants to say is thinking of being uh, uh, as a being is a fundamental mistake. It miss it misunderstands being in a fundamental way. So that's one thing we're trying not to think. Okay, and then the other one is 
well, well, we might say something, well, we're getting at the origin uh, of, of beings. And then we might think yeah, of yeah. that as something like the, the first being or the supreme being, some traditional notions of God. And Heidegger wants yeah, to answer. reject that. Yeah, go ahead. The ens perfectum, just to yeah, throw yeah. in the Latin, yeah, the perfect right. entity. Yeah. yeah, and so the perfect entity, so that's not... So then what you might think is, oh, well, being is just the, the most abstract category. You go up all your taxonomic categories and you get to the highest possible genus and that's being. And that's all we're talking about. We're just talking about an abstract category. And Heidegger says, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Go ahead, Johannes, you want to interject? Yeah, um, the, you, you'll find this in section one of Being in Time of the Introduction, where he yeah. lays out the three prejudices about being and the tradition in that sense agrees or Heidegger agrees with the tradition because the tradition would say, yeah, it cannot be defined. That it is not the highest genus, uh, but it is still the most universal somehow. So it, there's unclarity in the tradition itself, but even though the, the tradition never, but even though it saw these you know, issues with being, the tradition never pursued it further, according yeah. to Heidegger. It never pursued, it, it just seemed obvious. But, oh, yeah. it's just the most universal. Yes. But maybe, maybe it's not. Uh, but, but still, it, so there's already here right at the beginning was introduced is is obscurity or darkness or hiddenness yeah. or concealment. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Now the fourth one I'm going to say doesn't yeah. appear. It appears it's marginalia. It appears in the margins, uh, yeah, um, and yeah. then it gets taken up later. But I think it's fair. I think it was in his thinking at the time, and he also says. Uh, the, the the last temptation is to think of being as beingness, right? <laughs> Some sort of property that all beings yeah. share, and he he wants to reject that as well. And so, I hope that many of you, if you're following this, are are, are wondering like, well, what the hell remains, right? <laughs> like like what? <laughs> like you, uh, what? Are there alternatives to uh, those four? Like what's left over? Um, and, and, and so. For me, that's always been the problematic um, is, and and here's what I want to say uh, about that. Um, I think, first of all, there's something deeply right about it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, the problematic is not, here's why I'm building towards refuting Heidegger or anything like that. But, but the issue is, it is, I, I, I'm convinced that the appropriate way to resolve this is not just conceptually. There has to be something transconceptual going on. I think this is given by the very phenomenological approach he's taking. And it's, I'm trying to understand what is, I think this is fair, what is the transformation required of me in order to see, no, I'm going to use that word I used earlier, in order to realize my way through this. Mm -hmm. And so that I, get an apprehension, I'm trying to use the broadest term as I can, uh, being that properly articulates what Heidegger is trying to convey. So, so is that's that, that's how I want to yeah. pose the problematic. Okay, I'll I'll say something in a second. I mean, so Heidegger, it's the first word of being in time is a Greek word, and it's delon. Mm. Delon means obvious. It's a quote from Plato's Sophist. Yes, yes. Delon Gar. So in the quote reads, two and a half thousand years ago, it seemed obvious to you what we mean by the word being, but now we have become perplexed. Yes. So in the sophistic, in the dialogue on sophistry, and what is sophistry? I, I, I always point out, it's not just about, you know, running from market town to market town, selling knowledge. What sophistry does is it destroys access to the phenomena yes because once but if you just teach let's say virtue but you don't know what to, to go to plato's mino dialogue you you well you give someone let's say the, the rhetorical tools mm -hmm. to, to talk about virtue but not become virtuous or understand what virtue is hence this, this sophistry destroys access to phenomena so right from the beginning of being in time the first word is it seemed obvious it is no longer obvious. Yes. And Heidegger reminds us we must, again, this is something that the tradition did not pick up on. So we have two and a half thousand years of quibbling about being, either not, you know, and it, it, 
but it must, in some sense, every generation must ask the question again, uh, and not just also not just take Heidegger's word for it, um, because precisely because the, the phenomena change, they are historically conditioned, let's say, and hence the question must be asked again, but it's also tied back right from the start to the tradition, but also overcoming the tradition insofar as the philosophical tradition of ontology or metaphysics was not capable to consider what being and time because what he arrives at also in the introduction is that being was thought of as usia which he doesn't translate as presence but as anwesenheit which means um, sorry which doesn't translate as substance which is the usual translation but as presence Yes. And Uzia can also mean homestead, um, but here in being in time, we're still, he still understands Uzia really as Anwesenheit, which means uh, presence, let's just say presence. But when we think of presence, what we would have to consider is time. And this is where the tradition really, well, where the Greeks sort of, I don't want to say failed or made a mistake, but they didn't. Time did not become an issue for them. It didn't become a, a question, didn't become a problem, didn't become thematized. Time was a being amongst beings. Time was understood as, as, as the now, for example, for the most part. But it didn't become itself an issue. So once we try to understand being as presence that gives rise to the way in which beings are present, mm -hmm. then we have to ask for time. Hence, one could also speak not only of the forgetting or the oblivion of being, but the forgetting of time. Excellent. So let, let me just uh, respond then to that. Um, and this, of course, is something that this is a, uh, a softball in a sense to you, because, you know, well, well, well what I, I mean, uh, uh, one can think here of, uh, of, August, uh, of Augustine. I know what time is until you ask me. Right, uh, in the sense that, well, what do you mean? Um, uh, surely the Greeks knew about the the past and the present and the future and all all, all that. And, and you know, what's more familiar to me than time? Every moment, I'm aware of time, and everything's happening in time. Right? Yeah. And, and yeah, right. Yeah. And, but 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 Heidegger's point is this is also that that same familiarity that actually blinds us is the case for being as well. So, like, uh, yeah. So the t what, what I'm saying is, these two things seem to be related in my mind. We deal with the the familiarity and weirdness of being uh, yes. by 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 relegating being to the opposite of becoming, right? This is sort of yes. right, and then becoming, and then becoming and temporality get identified together and then yeah. being gets identified with the eternal and then that and then and then so that's and then that means that the question of time it, we don't have to really address it because it has been uh dichotomized separated profoundly uh from time uh, time has been made irrelevant to the question of being and then the the, the project of relating to being is then understood as the project of relating to eternity, which then, of course, easily also gets subsumed under relating to the most eternal thing and God, yeah. etc. Is that a fair uh, yeah. move to, to, yeah. to make? Yes. So one of the things we have to do then, this is sort of a fifth thing then, <laughs> is we have to ask what being is and try to forget that dichotomy. Uh, that makes it so natural to align being with eternity and mm -hmm. uh, put time with with becoming, with appearance, with with opinion, etc. Yes, uh, this just touches on the <laughs> well. Philosophy is a bit mad. Uh, the German word for this is uh, verrückt, which uh, translates to crazy or mad. But verrückt can also mean to be displaced. So the initial displacement of the of, of philosophical questioning is, well, as you know, yeah. why is there something rather than nothing, or how is it that there is? Something? Yes. And and but in order to be able to ask that question, you also have to be withdrawn already from just everyday concerns of beings. 
So the chorismos, let's say, the, 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 the distinction or the difference between being and beings has opened up. That's the beginning also of being in time, which for Heidegger now has to be um, thought again or thought anew in a post-metaphysical time. So that's another part of the yep. project. And yep. hence also time comes in. Because what Heidegger sees is, is after Nietzsche. So when he was speaking of uh, becoming becomes the realm of temporality, that's appearance. I mean, that's Platonism. And that's not yes. Plato, but Platonism yes. in a nutshell. This, this is the world of, you know, the two world theorem. Exactly. The ephemeral world of appearances somehow connects to the eternal world, etc. cetera. Uh, yep. And Nietzsche says both worlds have become a fable. Everything has collapsed. And what's left is a will to power and the eternal recurrence of the same, which is for Heidegger, the, the, the last ditch attempt of metaphysics to think and understand time um, through an eternal recurring. So basically ah, yes. an eternal becoming that is no longer really a becoming. It's, it's all, so yes, yes. hence we are really at a dead end. Um, and, and, you know, we talk lots about crisis. Um, but, but this is, is not a recent, and I've said this to you so many times, we've talked about this so often, yeah. it's not a recent development. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the crisis, for some reason, starts to spread as a phenomenon sometime after Hegel. The, um, yeah, one of Heidegger's teachers is Husserl, who um, gives a lecture course on the, uh, the, the crises, or crisis, sorry, of the European yeah. sciences. Yes, Another yes. teacher is, is Paul Natorp, one of the Neo-Kantians, who's never mentioned uh, in Marburg, he speaks of a, in a lecture course from 1921 of the a great field of ruin so that the tower has fallen. Yes. And, and the new Kantians, Herman Cohen, uh, he was aware of this also. I mean, they, they tried with reviving Kant uh, to overcome Hegel uh, and to revive uh, philosophy again and provide the categories necessary to make sense. Um, but so crisis at the time Heidegger writes the book has been around for what 50, 60, 70 years mm -hmm. and um, he tr so what the attempt really is is not just let, let's get being right in this sort of abstract uh, academic discourse but no, no. Le let's, make le let's make sure we have an access to what is and then we can articulate it yes, yes okay, so we've, we've, we've added to the problematic um, and we, 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 but no, but we've explained its pertinence and, and you, you've, you've, yeah. you've, you've elaborated on why I do not think this is a conceptual issue. I'm not saying that concepts will not play a role in, because we're talking and we're reflecting, but this is not just a conceptual issue. This is a more fundamental issue. Um, now I, so let's say, so in addition, we're not talking about like, like even that question, why is there something rather than nothing? Think about how you're just initially tempted to think there's a causal answer. That's a causal question. What was before this that made this? And of course, that that actually isn't the question that's being asked, right? But we, we so it's it's not a thing. It's not a super thing. It's not the perfect thing. It's not the highest abstract category. It's not beingness. And now it's not that which has been pointed to by the two worlds mythology. Okay, great good right um so what and i mean and 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 i'm not trying to be unfair because you know heidegger doesn't he literally does not complete the book um and so i i i understand that but heidegger thinks that if we properly frame the question and the relation that we will make progress i take it and so let, let me let me let me let me let me point to you on, on, on one move i see him making on the basis yeah. of phenomenology that is a, that might give us an initial sense of how do we step out of these things we've been talking about and one has to do with that dichotomy that you just in the two world but that's not the only dualism right and and when i one of the okay. things i think heidegger gets from the phenomenology is is a fundamental inversion um, yeah. In a good sense, not in like the the critique he makes of Nietzsche. What I, what is we 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 have proceeded with a framework of here are the thing here are the two the two. There's always mm -hmm. subject and object, or you know mm -hmm. uh, time uh, time and eternity. We have all these, and then we 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 try to build the relation out of them, and, and right. 
Yeah. And phenomenology. Yeah. Or, it, or, it runs, or it runs into dialectics. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Or the last ditch attempt to uh, yeah, save yeah. metaphysics. According yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Hegel's sense of di dialectic, not Plato's. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. And and what what he and what Heidegger gets from phenomenology, and I think in, in uh, I think in one sense from Husserl, but he does something very important. He says, no, 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 yeah. no. Right. Those those things like subject and object, subjectivity and objectivity. Those are abstractions from something that is not a dichotomy within the phenomenon. I'm trying to use that term as broadly mm -hmm. as you've been indicating here. If we really, really carefully pay attention and comport ourselves, to use one of his terms, to what's going on, we see, we see that our experience... Oh, I hate that term because that's it's laden with everything we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah. <laughs> but our experience, right, mm -hmm. does, does not it is it, not prop properly like I I see all of phenomenology is trying to get us to pay attention to how intelligibility is actually unfolding for us and getting us to realize, in the sense I talked yes. about earlier, that there is something before primordial to all these. Yes, things. what and and that's that was a speech. Sorry, but. but no, no, but this is, this is, this, I mean, so there's a lot of things that, but this is what Heidegger will come to call the clearing, the Licht. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That which initially clears before anything else can uh, at, at all appear or even become possible also in terms of a philosophical method. Something else that's important that you briefly touched on is the other dualism or dichotomy, let's say the subject object dichotomy. So something yeah. that people are concerned with probably also who listen to you or much is the subject object dichotomy or Cartesian subjectivity. Yeah. So one of the reasons also for Heidegger to write being in time is that he says we have an ontology that's based on, let's just simplify it, on Cartesianism, right. which means the I, I am I thinking of myself, this is certain. And how the world is out there is thanks to the guarantee of the hypothesis God. And, but there is a split introduced now between yes. subject and object or, or, or human being and world, um, which leads to all sorts of um, issues ontologically, but also psychologically, etc. cetera. And he, what Heidegger says is that the sciences have run into crisis yes. precisely yes. because they are based on this ontology, hence the need to establish or write or manifest a fundamental ontology which finds its foundations in what Heidegger calls or refers to as Dasein, which can only be thought of as being in the world. And now the reason why, and you mentioned this briefly, the, the book isn't up finished, so the second volume wasn't written, which would have been a destruction or a destruction of ontology. Um, in, to, so there are moments in which he destructs, for example, the issue that time was forgotten by the Greeks leads to Descartes understanding the world, overly simplified, as objectivity, yes, but as presence at hand. That yeah. means it's something that's just perfectly available. And yeah. hence, mathematics, nothing wrong with mathematics, but only math, a, math, a purely mathematical access becomes the only access to the world. So the world yes. becomes a, a, a secured resource. Um, and so the, he, he, he sees all of these, I mean, he kind of, he sees all of these issues, metaphysics coming to an end, uh, the, the crisis of modern ontology. And hence he has to write, a, he wants to destruct it, build it all down as it were, to provide a new foundation. And I think, though, the reason why he doesn't write the second volume is because in writing Being in Time, what you just were getting at, which is going beyond Being in Time, is that, that there must be something initially having opened itself up, the clearing, which mm -hmm. Heidegger is always in, related to and can never be separated from concealment and withdrawal. Yes. Yes. That's what he realizes writing Being in Time. And there are two moments in the book, which is section, so section 44, which is on truth and Alithia. Yes. The, where he begins to think, he retranslates Alithia and the audacity, you know, to go and say, well, look, this is how you understood truth for two and a half thousand years, let's say. Um, yeah. But 
<laughs> Anithia used to mean Lethe is the river of forgetting. Lanthano means I conceal. So let's just translate Anithia as unconcealment, but let's not forget the concealment. So mm -hmm. any unconcealment is predicated, we could almost say predicated on concealment. And then there's another, the, the second division begins on death. So right after truth as Alethea, when concealment, you know, to think of truth, there are these weird passages where Heidegger says, Dasein is simultaneously in truth and in untruth, which means Dasein is simultaneously in disclosure, but also in concealment. Yes. Yes. Any any disclosure that we make, let's make this very uh, practical, any discovery we make, any scientific discovery that we make simultaneously covers over, we don't know the hell what it covers over. It, it is, there's no way of, you know, it's not, oh, we've covered this. Oh, no, we don't, we don't even know because the, the process itself is simultaneous. Could, the discovery, could I, yeah. yeah. Could, I, could I interject here because... Yeah, yeah. Because for, for me... I mean, I know you have criticisms, but you know, uh, Dreyfus's inspiration from Heidegger on this led to the discovery of the frame problem and the frame problem relevance realization. And my work on relevance realization, I think, dovetails with this: that the the, the disclosure of truth is always relevant truth, and relevance is is always bound up with what has been ignored, ignored as irrelevant. You you cannot ever have one without the other. And so I see there being a fundamental connection there between what we're talking about in Heidegger and the kind of work I'm doing in cognitive science. Do you think, uh, do you think that's fair uh, to make that connection? Uh, yes, but you, it, it would have to be even more radical because it, ignore, ign um, to, to speak of ignorance or ignoring um, has already, and that's what it sounds like to me at least, requires some sort of realization. But the 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 right. No, 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 no. I mean, no, no. But that's so, the point. No, no. That's the point with relevance realization. It's not that kind of ignoring. It's not. I ignore it. In that sense, it's it's the sense that I I I I never it it never becomes a possibility for me to consider it because if I tried to yeah. consider all those things and then chose to ignore them, I would hit combinatorial explosion. No, no. It's a, it's a much <laughs> deep, it's, it's a much it's a it's a, that's why I said it's very much like a Zen Cohen. You're like there's a kind of intelligent ignorance going on that sounds contradictory and oxymoronic to our ears. So I think it okay, is. Yeah, that, okay, that's fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. And so for me, uh, like uh, for me, I'm just I'm trying to make a I'm trying to do a concrete, a little bit more concrete of a connection uh, for like the point you made about Heidegger's point about how this gets into the sciences. And the issues about subjectivity and objectivity are crucial issues in, in cognitive science, because that's the science that tries to understand knowing and, and yeah. subjectivity, right? And then yeah. this issue, at least I've been arguing, is, is something that has been slowly sort of making its presence, <laughs> making its presence felt within cognitive yeah. science, uh, right? And the understanding that, wait, wait, this is a fundamental thing that we're not properly recognizing in our science. Yeah. So if that's right, okay, yeah. then here's here here here's something I want to get at, and, I, I, and don't lose your the the part about the connection to death. Like I'm trying to get at because you didn't you didn't come you only did phenomena you didn't do logos, right? Well, logos is well I didn't mention it, but logos is the saying. So I don't like this this, this, this uh, translation of discourse in English. I would say saying or articulation um, in an apophantic sense. So to yes. let something see, in a, but it's communal. Uh, not every way of speaking is that specific totally. logos apophanticos. Yeah. So Heidegger makes, a, for example, he says, Euher, which means to beg or to ask for something is not that logos apophanticos in that relevant sense, but it is a communal speaking in which the speaker becomes the medium. And by the way, just to finish now the point on phenomenon, Heidegger says that we should understand the word phenomenon as coming from finest die, which is a middle voice form in the yes. uh, Greek grammar. So that's to say the phenomenon itself doesn't, you know, it, it appears, but yes, but it can also appear in something else or actually appears through a medium. And that medium is logos itself. That medium is the communal speaking and hearing.
Okay, great. Because that's what I wanted to get at. I wanted to get at the middle voice, communal. I, I, I wanted to get at like, and, and this is what I, I see what he's ah, maybe trying. Like for me, this notion of intelligibility and, and the way it's bound to being seems to be getting closer to what we're talking about here. Because intelligibility the intelligibility of this and the intelligibility of this are not the same thing, right? Uh, that, 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 but but I'm trying to get something, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that, that gives me access, like what that gives me access in my experience, such that I like, so, so that I can come to the clearing, so that I can come to the place for which I can apprehend being. In this way we're talking about this apophatic logos that you're talking about right like like that's why i was making the connection to relevance realization i'm trying to get the sense that right that right there that the way things are primordially intelligible to us is what heidegger is trying to get us to awaken to and that that intelligibility is not a perfect presencing but it's always a realization there's always the shining in but there's the moreness beyond what's shining in that that's what i'm trying to get at it but is that a red herring trying to make that connection because i'm trying to get back to what where the greeks were not where they have something to tell us about oh they have no they have everything to tell us so this is very important by the way so also the the presence itself let's say is never present right when we that's say right. being is never right. a being the presence itself which draws in the sense that show me the presence you know? show me time show me yeah. but the ink the inconspicuousness that does in german is das unscheinbare we talked about this in london also that which that which is, it's not something that doesn't appear but it 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 doesn't shine but it still gives rise for something to shine forth um the weather for example i mean show me the weather you know yeah, yeah, uh, this yeah, is a bit of a yeah. facetious example but the, that we, there's different phenomena of the weather. By the way, we're, I'm in Italy, and in Italy you don't say it's raining; you say piove, just simply piove. There's no, there's no it. There's nothing doing. It is piove, right. piove, raining, rain, right, right, rain, that's, rain. That's uh, so, uh, um, but yeah, I would th that connection. I think is 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 fair. Um, and the, the so the presence is never present. And what I really want to uh, avoid is. And of course, you know Heidegger when he writes being in time, he's a he's a young man, and uh, uh, you know what young men are like. Uh, you have to make a mark for yourself. So it, it, he, his tone changes over time. So in the beginning, you know, he actually does speak on the very first page of being in time. He says there's a fasoimness, so the, a failure, or um, they the the Greeks missed this yes, phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, I think there's also a moment when he speaks of a, almost a catastrophe or so in Plato. Uh, but but that that disappears the older he gets, um, and it it becomes I think the what's instead of understanding Heidegger as someone who says everything is wrong up until me, it's better to understand him as saying every way of understanding being has its epoch and its time, and we can learn from those to make it sim easy but simple for us now. But it's we have to find. Our own, to yeah. come back to what you said, primordial path uh, uh, to the phenomena, but always in in um, in dialogue with the tradition. And he's he in that regard spe speaks of Zuspiel, which he, I think he takes from football, which he calls soccer in Northern American English. Yeah, so yeah. Zuspiel is the uh, when you, you're playing the ball to uh, uh, someone so that he can uh, yes. score. Yeah. So. Are you okay. playing fourth. Okay. Okay. So this is helpful because then I want to, I want to propose another way in which we can get mistaken about this, which is we can confuse intelligibility with semantic meaning. Yes. Okay. Now we have to talk about propositionality, etc. Yeah. Go on. No, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, that's the point I'm making. That, that right. So one of the one of the ways in which, like, given everything we've said, the temptation is right that what 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 intelligibility is is, is semantic meaning. It's a relation between propositions, and I, I and notice the what is sought for. I can get clarity. I can get pure right 
a pure disclosure, a pure presencing of the relations through the conceptual analysis, and then that will give me the meaning, and that is what intelligibility is all about. And if the argument up to now is right, then, mm -hmm. and this, this converges with arguments I make about how relevance can't be a propositional property, right? Mm -hmm. Then we get another profound way in which, like, this isn't a confusion about being, this is a confusion about how we try to understand the relationship between intelligibility and being. Because if we misapprehend apophatic logos as semantic relation, then we are again blocked from the kind of thing that Heidegger is trying to get us to see. That's a proposal I want to make to you. Yeah, fair. <laughs> So, so but, but, then, but but then there's a problem. There's a deep problem. And and, and here's my and, and so here's now more of a challenging question to Heidegger. Yeah. What are you doing outside of the propositional to make this possible? What are you doing outside of the propositional to get us free from that confusion? Because I would argue that if you if 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 in, if in your approach or your method you take that as your first identification identification, your first step, you're going to get locked into all these other things in a very profound way. Now, that's a little bit preposterous of a proposal, I know, but I, I'm, I'm willing to argue it. But let, for the sake of argument, give it to me. And then, like, it's like, I think that I want to know, yeah. this is what I meant about, I don't think you, you can answer this question conceptually. I'm not saying concepts don't matter, but there's, what else are we doing? If we grant... Sorry, Joanna. So, Joanna well, so, if we grant the intelligibility <laughs> is not conceptuality, it's not semantic well, meaning, then what, what do we, we have? What we have to grant, and now it's every. Now I'm going to attract all the wrath uh, from from everyone who deems himself a rationalist. Um, experience. Uh, Heidegger it can, can. I mean, you know, we'll say more, but. Heidegger continues to say that he's made an, he's made a certain experience in his thinking. By the way, this can now I can now bring this briefly back to death. Uh, right. Death is the beginning right. of the second division, and right. something happened. So I wrote my book on death, um, and I thought you know it, it's a few things in being in time, obviously very important, but death continues to reappear. And the reason I think for this is is when you read this and you don't read it. So there's different ways of reading also. I mean, the being in time itself is a self-investigation of Dasein. Dasein gets to know itself for the first time. And it gets to know its existentialia. So, and all of a sudden, and this is the only reason why he can understand truth all of a sudden in terms of being in the world, which has to do with hermeneutical discovery. That is itself a different form of understanding or to use your own intelligibility than we would usually think of. Because mm. it is one that really is in the every in average everydayness, which is not propositional. The world does not light up to us purely or uh, appear purely um, purely propositionally. Um, it, it 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 appears in a weird familiarity. It, it appears inconspicuously, etc. But in death, reading these passages on death, what one can witness, I think, is that Dasein here is pushed towards its as Heidegger calls it, almost possibility of being, which at the same time shows Dasein that it, it's impossibility of existence. So in this intensity of getting closer to one's most authentic possibilities, it all slips away. And I think Heidegger sees this mm. exactly in, this is why he doesn't write the second volume, I think, is because he ignites here as a thinker, namely, he ignites as a thinker who, who sees, I have to follow this with this withdrawal. I have to follow that draft, that disappearance, mm. that way of disappearing. And then the language changes. The language in the second division of being and time changes. It, it, it's less academic. It becomes not all, not the entire division, obviously, but parts of it are really bloody weird, you know? Um, yeah. and, and hence also the, the later turn to the poets, because for Heidegger, poetry uh, can articulate this better than maybe propositional language can. So that's just a, a few introductory remarks. I don't no, think. No, 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 that's great. I've yet... Yeah. Go on. No, no, that, sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't mean to stop you. No, no, uh, no, no. Go so I'm, uh, yeah, 
I, I, yeah, I'm trying to get at that. I, 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 okay, so, right, and, yeah, so, so, I mean, in the poesis, you're getting into the sense making and you're getting into, right, this inevitable tonos, this creative tension between things becoming present to us. Well, they also would, I mean, the whole point about poetry is it's constantly doing that. Things are being said uh, and conveyed, but they're also being withdrawn. Yes. In a non-propositional manner, gr grammar very often, in the, and this it's is not, not Dadaism or 20th century poetry in form really disappears, but this is the poetry of Goethe, this is the poetry of Hölderlin, uh, um, for example, who where, where grammar disappears, um, yes. and and still the phenomena themselves, they're there. We can see the world. Mm. Mm. So, what then? So, first of all, I don't, I, I, I don't think. I'm thinking about dialogue. The what is it? A dialogue with this? What's it called? That little dialogue with a Japanese person. What's the title of that? Uh, uh, I think it's just something like um, Gespräch. Uh, sorry, dialogue with the Japanese scholar. Yeah, I think so. And there, and there's, as far as I know, yeah. And, and he's it's probably an allusion to D.T. Suzuki or something, right? And there's yeah. there's there's this deep discourse between Zen and of course the Kyoto School is deeply influenced by Heidegger and Zen. Uh, so uh, I, I'm trying to get at, does Heidegger, I'm, I'm not denying this, the, 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 I like, I'll use your language and it's poetic, so it's example, the igniting of experience, right? I'm, I'm putting two things you said together, the igniting of experience in his work. But are there things other than reflection on poetry that we should be doing to more properly ignite experience? For example, like the, the you know Nishitani would argue that you have to do, uh, you know, there there's various meditative and contemplative practices mm. that mm. are needed yep. in, in order for you to get the uh, the, the these deepest uh, disclosures, the deepest kind of aletheia. I'll get to this in a second by a bit of a detour to make this clear again, I mean, so uh, to make this a bit clearer, how, how Heidegger understands what he comes to call metaphysics or philosophy in general, which let's say begins with Plato and Aristotle and continues all the way to Hegel and maybe also Nietzsche. Right. Some degree right. Nietzsche, but Nietzsche, Nietzsche is already at the very edge. So he's already actually in the collapse of metaphysics. Yeah. All of this for Heidegger speaks within or from out of the same experience of being. But that remains unquestioned. And it, it, that's why the question is not asked. It's not because it's they, no, no one was as clever as me, look at me. No, it's because it made sense. It was a long tradition that made sense, but it has come to an end. And yeah. now we're in desperate need, let's say, of being of being, but also of, of, of being touched by being again. Yes. And for, and now this ties in, or this leads to your, your, your question, in what way can one attune oneself to this? Yes. Now, um, I think when you look at um, Heidegger himself, it's... Well, it's 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 a giving up first of all of on, on subjectivity. Uh, that that would be the the beginning, and, and uh, one would have to give up on th thinking of oneself as an acting I. Uh, I think also uh, that doesn't mean you cannot say I, but that would be perhaps one initial um, starting point, if you like. We can also sense that it's it's a it's it's a in a rereading of the tradition that, well, that becomes, so you see the, the where academic philosophy is, for example, 
yeah, yeah. Academic philosophy. It's analytical. Analytical. This is this is very strange to think about it. Analytical philosophy begins in the moment when metaphysics has collapsed, and it yeah. collapses into positivism, basically, which wants to be anti-historical. Yes, yes. It wants to be. This is this is significant because yes. this actually they speak of the end of history before anyone. Basically, they say we don't, we don't need nothing anymore. It's complete uh, futurism, futurism, just being cut off from yeah. anything. Yeah. So that so. But that didn't work out, right? Not everything can be formalized. And now you have entire his- departments of the history of analytical philosophy. At the same time, um, there's there's now a reading backwards of the tradition, which very often can some purely amount to uh, applying certain isms or models of our time to the, was Spinoza an idealist or was he a realist? But not, you know, or let's have new realism. Let's have, which will, by the way, lead to new skepticism, and that will lead to a new idealism. So you know, we can turn this forever. But Heidegger says, why should we have all of these epigonal renaissances, and instead not try to read the tradition, what the tradition didn't pick up on? So there are these 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 seeds almost that mm. no one picked up on, and those we need to turn to, and see whether we can provide the fertile ground. So that it can, well, it can grow and become our own, but also in a way, always in this, uh, there's a German word for it, which is uh, Anverwandlung. So we appropriate something, but we appropriate it so that we become transformed, yes. but also it becomes, but also it, right? Yeah. So the, the, in some sense, the future begins to alter the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a reciprocal reconstruction. I get that. Um so let me let me keep pushing on this though. I, I like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. For example, I have taken it, and other people have too. Our, our, our you know, uh, somebody we both know, Guy Sandstock, and other people, you know, uh, Thomas Stoddinger and others, take it as one of the ways in which we try and actually put into practice what Heidegger is. Is we what Heidegger is doing is we try to give up on the monological model of reason the model yeah. on the monological model of how you philosophize and the idea here is like if you're saying all these sentences like we're saying but you're still bound into a monological frame you're still all you're still working with fundamentally within the cartesian grammar and that what we need to do is to I don't, I don't even want, let me use the word reconceive, but I want to use conceive not only as thought, but to give birth. We want to reconceive, right, our ability to philosophize as something that is properly dialogical in nature. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to be coy here. This is a, this is an argument I have been developing. This is a way I've been trying to say we need, we need, this is a way in which we can put into practice Right, a, a, a way, a, a breaking out of that grammar, so that we can now pick up <clears throat> seeds. The dialogical seed was clearly there in Plato's dialogues, and it's not picked up. Philosophers write some dialogues here and there along the way, and there's some Neoplatonic philosophers who really, you know, Erigena, reality is inherently dialectical, things like that, right? But for me, that's a, that's a concrete example of what you're talking about. To, right, it's not a proposition. Oh, look, we should have thought that trees are actually mammals. It's not that. It's like no, no, no. Right? Yeah. We pick up on something that would actually enact us breaking out of that Cartesian grammar in a, well, in a direct, in a directly transformative and, in the sense you're using the word, experiential way. Can it ignite experience for us in a way that we could see? realize apprehend being in a new way the intelligibility of being in a new way so i'm saying that's something as a concrete proposal that i have been engaging in um and other people i'm not taking sole credit i've named a bunch of other people that are doing the same that's what i'm saying right it, it, it is right are there things beyond what heidegger well, that, that's trivial of course there has to be but i what i'm trying to say is i'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at like that I'm gonna uh, maybe I'm I, 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 I'm being too coy with myself. I, it seems to me that to we need an ecology of practices to properly follow Heidegger on what he is proposing. Yeah, and we need a 
if you forgive me, a deinstitutionalization of it also. Sure, sure, uh, sure. Was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, of, I mean, not of what you're doing, but of uh, of philosophy itself. Um, because once it's 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 to come back to being in time, if the so the, this is also important though the the they self does man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which makes no sense in English. You should know anyone who's English out there should know in German we actually speak of man, man, man all the time, and it's an ominous self. Um, yeah. You you, sp you can have personal sentences that are completely just concerned you yourself, and you will say man. It's not just others ominously out there. It's an existential of being human. Uh, right. It's to be taken over by a, a, a well a certain desire for being released from the burden of existence and anything that institutionalizes for heidegger actually one way or another turns into uh if it becomes too overbearing um is taken over by das man so i think what one must develop is this sort of uh, i talked to guy zengsuk about this recently is a bit of a a playful um um, uh, en engagement but also with 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 the withdrawal with the concealment yes but one has to be mindful and and accepting also that one is never oneself fully enlightened let's say we, we are taken in by the, the the clearing is a clearing for self for concealment um yes. it, it, it cannot so it would have to, one would have to accept that uh also that it's there's one cannot reach, let's say, a yeah, yeah. A, a highest level or state uh, or so, but that it's the authentic cannot be separated from the inauthentic. That clearly. Okay, so let, let me see if that uh, this is how it's landing with me. Uh, this goes towards something I think we've talked about. I think you and I and Daniel talked about it, um, like uh, the, that giving up another. Yeah, yeah. The giving up of the sacred as the uh, as the complete, as the finished, as the final, as the totalization, um, and that idea instead of trying to find deeply meaningful and vivifying um, the inexhaustible, rather than seeking rest, rather than seeking finality, rather than seeking completion. Um, uh, James Carson's idea of playing the infinite game. Um, to pick up on your play metaphor. Uh, that seems to me to be also something that requires, like the sacred is not that that you change just by talking differently about it. That, mm -hmm. that, that is to not properly apprehend it as the sacred. The sacred has to be that, you, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think it's just, sorry, no, you should go on, but it, it's really crucial. And I think this is, you know, why I'm, trying to do what I'm trying to do, <laughs> yes. uh, which is to, uh, I, and I sometimes I've been wondering these past couple of months, what, what am I doing? <laughs> like yeah. wake up and I think this is, it has this really been happening. Am I really teaching in the way that I'm doing? What, why am I doing it? I don't know. But I think it, it's, it's becoming clearer again to me because there's no, there's no, so there's no prestige in it. Uh, there's no status in it. There's, there's nothing. It is probably just ridicule in it. Uh, from, from at least from the institutions, um, but what what ha what happens during the seminars is because it's so completely free from any instrumentality, mm -hmm. is that they become electric. Yes. The, 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 yeah. the, the, so yes. you see, this is the we we have to. I was just wanted to second what you were saying because it's now just coming up that, that we need to go into the, if you like, the practical or the deed of it also so it needs to become uh, communal um yeah. and where what really is at stake is this attempt to reconceive yeah uh, this experience of being or bring it about or try and be a midwife to this new experience yeah. you know this is i think this is also how you can escape institutionalization is it remains an erotic play yes Sorry. You... I think that's right. I th and and that's the the notion of the sacred as bound up with right the 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 falling in love with being again. Um, and for me, that that's part of um, what I'm, I, 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 is coming to the fore 
uh, that. Yeah, that's beautifully put. That's th that falling in love again, because that means to fall, you have to let go. Yes. You, and you have to be willing to fall. <laughs> you have to be willing. It's, yeah, yeah. And you, but, you don't know it. Yeah. But it's not. But it's not empty thrashing. It's not that kind of fall. It's the kind of fall no. that's also the falling in love. It's the reciprocal opening. It's the participation. Yeah. It, 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 it's the commitment. Um, it, it's all of that. So let let me. I, we didn't even get to time yet, <laughs> uh, but we're we're making good progress. We'll here. get to time. Yeah, yeah. If we have time. Uh, <laughs> so that, was bad, that was a bad joke. Okay, because I I wanna. I, I want to, because I think there's something deeply resonant between love in this sense. This is also another seed from the Platonic Christian tradition. I want to try and pick up in some fashion um, and, and and reconceive it. Um, but I think love has something to do with, you, you know, so so Heidegger talks about these, uh, I don't know what the, what the English, the three dimensions like that are important for understanding temporality and even eternity is part of temporality if you properly understand it right but these dimensions of thrownness projection and concern right and and they they roughly can they roughly correspond i don't know what the right verb is here to the the past the future and the present um as experiential things not just linguistic pointers um because I think this is going to be an audacious claim. Uh, one of the ways we can re-understand love is precisely how it engages those three in a profound way. You fall in love, you're thrown into it, you're deeply concerned about it, and it projects possibilities for you and who you can radically be that you were not, not otherwise not available to you or discernible by you. Love is properly doing that in a very profound way. First of all, does that even land as a proposal for you? Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying to make a connection with this capacity for falling in love with being again and yeah, yeah. the way in which it gets us <sighs> properly interpenetrated with our temporality in the Heideggerian sense because of the way it calls us into, makes us reverberate with our thrownness, our concern, and our projection. That's what do you think about that as a proposal about making that connection? Yeah, very good. Uh, we, I think we should, yes, let's move into time. Okay. Um, obviously, yes. just to be to pointed out these three dimensions of time already that Heidegger sees, which are connected to the three dimensions of time that the, as he calls it, the ordinary understanding of time also yes. presents us, the past, the present, and the future. Right. What he sees as an issue though here is that these are disconnected from one another. And that the past of the future flows into the present, flows into the past. And well, what we're mostly concerned with is the current now. Uh, yeah. The past maybe becomes of historiographical or so interest, but he's he sees he wants to understand time as ex or he understands time as ecstatic meaning out of itself or taking us out of ourselves. Yes. And also, this is something perhaps that, yeah, he actually, he mentions only in passing almost. He asks in the question, why is it that we think of time as fleeting? And he says it's because of our, it's because we haven't really faced death yet. Uh, it's our fleeting knowledge of death that leads to our fleeting understanding of time because we haven't considered time as our own most possibility. And if you understand time, for example, purely as linear, then projecting possibilities uh, also be, it becomes very different from, um, uh, well, projecting possibilities in, in an ecstatic sense, which by the way, ties to how we understand, how we can understand or, or, or relate to the tradition as mm. ecstatically throwing something at us and throwing us into something which we can project as a as possibility towards a horizon of possibilities and some of which we will act on and others we won't um, but <clears throat> the uh, most important perhaps uh, uh, part is perhaps to understand that 
the past is never just past. The past is gewesen sein, or in English, that which has been. And as such uh, continues and comes towards us from the future. So Zukunft is coming towards. But, uh, but well, by the way, also uh, briefly, because this is something that is important when we speak about love and falling in love with being, the German word for, for possibility is Möglichkeit. And possibility is a perfectly fine translation for Möglichkeit for the most part. And it makes sense. But Mögen Heidegger understands, especially after being in time, sometimes also in its verbal meaning, uh, so Möglichkeit in its verbal meaning of Mögen, which means to like and to love. Oh, wow. So I didn't can, know that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's a profound. This is why in the, in, in the letter on humanism, he calls das Sein ist das Mögliche, which in English, so he, das Mögliche is, so he, he, he absolutely uh, wants to show us that he means mögen in a sense of to like and to love. Right. And that's translated into English as being is the possible, which makes no sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so they didn't, they didn't, the, the translators didn't pick up on that. Um, but it's it's um, right there. It's das Mögliche being is das, that means being is that which likes us, affords itself to us, gifts itself to us if we like it and love it back. Right, right, right. Okay, that's that is really powerful. And, and uh, you know the the for me, I hear like I, so. Let me just stop. What we're saying here is really relevant to, I think, a misappropriation of Eastern philosophy, which is the idea that only the now is real. Right? Uh, the, only the now is real. And uh, the future and the... And so being in the now is all that matters. And, and I think that's a you know, that's a radical truncation of what mindfulness means. Um sati means to remember to remind which is already an inherently yeah, temporal yeah. notion and to yeah, make, yeah. right come like you're just not uh, right and, and, and that you know and then of course eternity is often the eternal the the eternity is the the i don't know the the now without limit or something the the the, the unextended now the or the infinitely extended now or something like that is how people um and and for me this Whenever I try, I remember doing this when I did a course on the philosophy of time, and you know, you do, and Bergson talks about Duray, and I'm trying to get at, <laughs> I'm trying to get at Duray, right? I'm really trying to get at this this notion, and I, and I'm really, and you know, and, and of course he says it's, it's intuitive and all that, but the, the point I'm trying to get at is, as soon as you try and do the now thing, you get to the specious present, like, like. When people do that move, they don't realize how corrosive it is, right? Because, because it, it, it goes like this. It goes like this, like this, like, like this. You don't get eternity. You get you get what Han talks about. You get the complete atomization of time until it, it yeah. becomes this, this, like this, what did James call it? The specious present that, that like, right? And then all of existence, all of reality is reduced, right? In such a... And, and and why the hell would you love that? That is not anything in which anything that can bear love or that can even constitute love. For me, that mm -hmm. that that do you like? I I'm I I know you weren't saying this, but I'm saying what what you're saying or what you're you're voicing. Heidegger is saying it's a criticism of this whole thing that is becoming very prevalent right now and, and without yeah. a recognition of how corrosive it is and how, how atomizing it is and how ultimately it's nihilistic it's deeply nihilistic yeah and it takes time again as a being amongst beings exactly it's a verification exactly. of time um yes whereas what heidegger shows us is and, and, and so but this is maybe crucial as you pointed out you know, I had a convers I had conversations last year with a, a professor of mathematics at Berkeley, and I'm not going to mention his name, but he, he said uh, it, it strikes him that probably Heidegger thinks after time because time is for us becoming an issue. 
So, and, and that to me is, is crucial. Maybe there, there is something weird about our time insofar as now time seems to be, be everything, you know, we use, you're at 12 p.m. Toronto time, I'm at 6 p.m. Yeah, Italian yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the time has become one of the parameters by which we run the globe. But this behind me here, uh, is not that it doesn't exhaust time. The the, the time no. is a parameter by which we can steer uh, the cybernetic globe. That, that you know that's one part of it, but it doesn't exhaust the full dimensionality of time. And so it it seems to become an issue really for for us for some reason. And that perhaps is also something to ponder. But maybe this withdrawal into the now, which seems to be uh, prevalent in yeah. Um, Certain, you know, people who look for help or uh, or, or guidance uh, by focusing on the now. Maybe that's in some sense the attempt to again cancel out time. Yes, in, in, yes. as it were. But but then remain with time that is basically still predicated on the ordinary understanding of time as linear and just passing us yes. by and flowing away and never yeah. to be returned. Whereas when we think of time as ecstatic, that is as taking us out of time itself is not is time proper is arising and is giving and i think here's also the connection to the, the later understanding of heidegger and of, of being which is being as gift or giving itself yes and of course the human being in a receivership a gift is not you know if i gift you something and you don't even, you don't consider it or don't look at it it's not it is not a gift or has to be accepted right. received appreciated yeah, and the deep connections he's drawing between thinking and thanking in that sense. The deep, right? Uh, yes, right, right, right. But then that means, right? That means that there's there there are virtues that need to be cultivated if we're going to properly realize time, yeah. right? Because if we cannot have patience and gratitude and receptivity, then this is this what we're talking about here is not going to be anything other than words to people especially i think gratitude and patience is an interesting word because it comes from pasien uh which means to suffer also to undergo um, them right yeah yeah, yeah to, to, to and to undergo and, and yes so the the uh, you know to just to, to stay on heidegger he himself gave lots of talks in the 50s and 60s to philosophical laymen, uh, either to his, you know, to, to, to in, in his hometown, there's the talk on Gelassenheit, releasement, where he says, don't, don't condemn technology, say yes and no. Yeah. Be released towards things and be open to the mystery. So here we have two, because you were asking before, and it, obviously, you know, it's sometimes it comes a bit later, but uh, two same modes of being or ways of responding that one can cultivate. Mm. Be released yeah. towards things, release yourself into the world in that manner, but also be open, remain open to the mystery. So that in, and this is some of the, you know, now we're getting into different topic perhaps, but yeah. uh, in Heidegger says in technology, there is a sense waiting to be discovered that we haven't seen yet, but that's just the side. But so yes, there are moments where you, you can find also in Heidegger, um, not in being in time to be no, strict because no. that's you know that's a yeah yeah it's not it's purely descriptive yeah blah, 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 blah. but one can cultivate of course uh, coming from this uh, certain uh, comportments to use also his language so certain ways of behaving that's a beautiful english word uh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 to be and have yeah, at yeah. the same time yeah so glazenheit i mean um which you invoked, I mean, that that releasement, um, he gets it clearly, and I think Caputo makes a good case for this. I think it comes out of Eckhart properly. Um, and that that brings me in, I mean, uh, one thing I want to talk to you about some is the relationship between Heidegger and Christian Neoplatonism, because I think it's a lot more intricate than uh, is often understood, uh, uh, especially through people like uh, Eckhart. Uh, and of course, it's no coincidence that Suzuki also picks up on Eckhart in order to try and make DT Suzuki to make connections. But I want to try and get at because you know Eckhart makes the argument that Galaisenheit requires 
this fundamental metanoia, uh, this fundamental radical kenosis, this radical emptying. Like what I'm saying is it, it, it requires, I'm going to use this in Hado sense, it requires really profound spiritual exercises uh, to realize it. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that it's only for elites, because Eckhart is giving his sermons to the peasants, and he's proposing something that they can engage in even in their peasant life, um, if that doesn't sound elitist. I don't know what other term to use. Um, and, and so, again, this brings me to, I want, I, like, the cultivation of Gleisenheit, I think, is a very radical in the sense of going to the root and also opening up possibilities that have not been opened up. I'm trying to use both senses of the word radical. I think that's a very radical proposal for a human being. I think it like does this does this lead to a conclusion that I think is prominent in the Neoplatonic tradition, especially the Christian Neoplatonic tradition. And Spinoza even has it. You can hear the last echo of it within the Cartesian framework within Spinoza. That truth is actually, the deepest truths are only disclosed in transformation, in profound trans. So that truth is in that sense, you know, we, we only know it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say purely retrospectively because we have the prospective longing, but we only completely realize it in the transformation that we're called to. We only know it, so to speak, by how we have moved away from illusion or delusion, we don't we don't ever grasp it itself. It's like time in that sense, right? It it, it it is it is what affords the propulsion of intelligibility, but it's not anything that we actually itself grasp. This is what Spinoza tries to get at when he says, "Truth is its own standard. You only see it <clears throat> when you realize what was previously false. You can't just sort of do it to, like have it directly." So here's the argument I've made: <clears throat> Galazenheit in Eckhart is bound up with profound transformation and that's bound up with the the neoplatonic often christian neoplatonic claim that the deepest truths are only disclosed in profound transformation and this is the opposite of the cartesian proposal that reached its culmination in leibniz the other to spinoza right that no we can come up with a universal calculus uh right um that does not require us in any way to undergo all we have to do is know how to use that technology and then we're fine uh, so that's that's the argument i've made to you and i think maybe just to add to this in with the last one that's is also the is, is letting oneself into, but also letting beings appear in us in, so that one, well, it's to use this word, a, a decentering uh, yes. of, of oneself to begin to see that we are, we are Paschen, the suffering participants also in a patient yeah. uh, sense, but not only of course, of, um, well, of, of the unfolding of being itself. And that that hasn't ended. It is simply the responses that were given yes. um, that 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 have, that have really have exhausted themselves. And so, by however beginning to see, well, you could almost say oh, in this grander, uh, almost cosmic, uh, um, well, I would I would really say it's, it's difficult because there's no word for Geschichte. So. <laughs> I, I always struggle. It's not history because history yeah. in English means mostly the past. And of course we yeah. can say history is unfolding, but that means events. Geschichte is, is, is the past, the present and the future yeah. coming together in one ecstatically forming one. But of course, you know, this coming together isn't, again, it's not a totality. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. it really, yeah. it, it actually is, is, is one, let's say bubble. That, that that begins to uh, form, that bursts and that forms a million others. Um, but the the so what I think what I don't I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to hear more on 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 the uh, Neoplatonism 
and what the the clearer connection or maybe you know but then you see so that maybe i can say something uh more directly on it yeah but um gelassen for heidegger he, he's in some sense for him the 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 future let's say lies in a complete disregard for some complete abandonment not disregard abandonment of any sort of subjectivity hence heraclitus becomes also so important where there is no acting subject uh it's it's few uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. the unfolding of yeah. and he, he goes to homer for example certain passages in which when we translate it in the proposition manner as we're used to today then it's uh, odysseus himself who's who's you know he's crying because he's sad but no, the, the tears come over him. Yes, uh, yes he's yes. taken by it, and so that that sort of way of thinking is that's maybe a, a if you like a, a certain practice also that one can yes know, in, just in, in 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 saying or in 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 languishing in articulating something, um, not going to the general you or uh, some sort of propositional articulation. But an attempt to say something without a subject that acts. Yes. And instead, going into this event character of the pure occurring and try and say it in that manner and see what changes. And that to me, you know, that could be releasement. That could be a really, it's not a releasement, you know, I release myself of myself. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to get away from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what what you that what you just described was something that you can see the Neoplatonic tradition, especially when it enters into Christianity, uh, or Christianity, yeah. uh, uh, an articulation of the, uh, of uh, 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 you know of participation in the Platon, uh, Platonic sense, right? Participation is 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 what I think you were that that what you're doing with your hands, right? Um, and and so what the what what I'm trying to get to. And now is there's a kind of transcendence happening here, right? And right, and yet, how do we get that without the two worlds mythology? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we might. Mu- we have so the, the task is to keep open the schism, yeah, or else the phenomena also collapse into a sheer immediacy. That, yes. That's the story of the of, of the prisoners in Plato's cave. Yes, they yeah. take in what's seemingly immediate, but it is only through the schism that's opening up by the, the suffering, painful, yeah, exiting the cave and the and the return. Let's not yes. forget the return into the yeah. cave. Uh, that transform return into the cave that we begin to see that there's a what is and what is not can now be uh, separated so how does this not turn into platonism yes um, so one always has to distinguish between marx and marxism or hegel and hegelianism yeah. or plato and platonism yeah yeah they, they of, of course you know this it's maybe a thing that's impossible because you cannot stop um, the, the the unfolding or how people receive um, yeah. Uh, yeah. what the initial thought is. That's one of the issues about the authentic inauthentic. You know, I mean, the the, the uh, Nietzsche suffers through the eternal recurrence of the same. He's <laughs> he's he's really. I mean, Luz Alome talks about this. How he suffered from this thought. Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's a, it's a, and now it's a. You can read it on Wikipedia. Oh, it's a thought experiment. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, but yeah. you know, so the heaviest, most terrible thought can turn into a, a five-minute video on YouTube. But <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> so. The the, the t- <laughs> that that to me is is the profound question. Is you know, instead of so that has to do ultimately it comes back to how we teach and yeah. how we how how well how we teach and how that teaching and those well what goes into that teaching before and if it's just a, again if it's just a propositional teaching that to use your uh, language from before that it speaks within the grammar of of cartesianism let's say yeah uh, so that you know tries to get something perfectly right or that this is not correct or that, um th- then that that sort of leads to um 
the same issues that we've had before, but if the, the, I don't know, the, if the teaching itself is a, a different one, it can at least lead to, well, an, in, an intensity also with the, the students or the learners to un understand that this is not purely something that can be, uh, or that is just you know, up for debate in, a, in an academic sense. But ultimately, I think the, because it is the schism or the horismos that must open up and that must be kept open. The, I don't know whether we, whether the sort of, some sort of two world issue or mythology or, 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 or paradigm, I would almost say, um, it's not, you know, I'm not saying this is around the corner or so, but the, it's, nothing can be, it, it cannot be made, uh, one cannot get rid of it, I think, because it's, it, it's inbuilt in thinking itself. Do mm. you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's insofar as the, 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 the schism needs to be held open, but also then bridged again. Yeah. And, and brought together, you, it, it cannot be purified to such a degree <laughs> that, um, to such a degree that now, now this will never happen again. Um, right. I think right. rather, I think Good rather point. to come back to this, th 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 there's a return into the cave. So the cave doesn't disappear. Now that's striking. Why doesn't he, he comes back down and he's faced with death and everybody ridicules whoever was freed. Um, but he goes back down out of also compassion, by the way. Yeah. So there's agape. the virtue of compassion that's made. Yes, yes there's and, agape in there too, yeah, right? Yes, a, 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 and <clears throat> so it's a it has to be achieved again and again, mm. Mm. again and again. Hence, uh, Heidegger said to a student once, uh, he, he, "We don't Heideggerianize here, so don't use my language for this. Oh. This is an attempt of saying it." you have to find your own language, which is not to say your own private little personal subjective language mm -hmm. that no one understands, but this is something we have to, well, almost, you know, not fight out, but work out again and again. And, but, but you probably have your own thoughts. So I'd like to hear those before I keep monologuing. No, no, no. On. <laughs> I, I think that's fundamentally right. And, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to get you know, this notion of transcendence that we find in time and love and being that isn't well described by the two worlds mythology. I, I agree with you that 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 mythology is in some sense we 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 will uh, I'll totally agree with this statement. Uh, we cannot purify our experience so that mythology will not arise again. It will continually arise. Um, and, and there's something about continually overcoming it that is part of the kind of transcendence I'm talking about. Um, right? Not transcendence within the two worlds of mythology, but a continual transcendence of it. That's non-completable. I, I totally grant that. And for me, that has deep analogy maybe not even analogies, something stronger than analogy to what happens in love. You keep thinking you've got the person. And as soon as mm. you do that, you've killed love, right? You have to, you have to get the person yeah. so that you're willing to give it up so that you can get the person. So you're willing to get it, give it up so that you get the person. That's the kind of thing I'm trying to point to. And it seems to me that that is also the, the, the proper experience of time. It's, it's like, there's a giving that we receive in order to give it up so that we can receive in order to give it up so that we can receive. Um, and, and that's the connection I'm trying to draw. And so I'm, I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, like uh, if people understand the, my project is John is trying to purify things. So we'll never do that. No, too, I'm not doing that at all. I'm not no, I'm no. right. Right. But I'm trying, I, but I am doing what I'm trying to propose to you right now. Yes. And also to be able to see it, that that that's that's yes that's half the ticket let's say yeah yeah, uh, yeah. to be <laughs> because it is it is an issue that that's again it's fundamentally at the heart of the crisis 
yes. is the collapse is the collapse of that two world paradigm because it exactly. gave exactly. Uh, it gave sustenance to the, the 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 realm or the world of appearances, um, and, and and not with it, and not with not without good reason. There was good reason why it was able to do that, right? Like you say, it, it fits into so much of how our experience like presents itself to us, upper and lower, our language. Yes, but but yeah. but that doesn't mean it hasn't collapsed. For me, that is part of the 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 the, the bite of the meaning crisis. Is like like we, we yeah. yeah that's yes no it, it, that's that's the issue of, of of our time is that this is what I'm, I, I alluded to before where is where is philosophy now for the most part the, the tradition is fully available we've not had Plato's yeah. texts and Parmenides texts and Heraclitus's texts and yeah. everybody Aristotle everything that you know type it in and you can read everything all at once it doesn't mean that this access that's there in terms of pure in terms of pure availability is a genuine access to you know yeah. yes an access to the problems and we can fight forever you know when Aristotle contradicts himself here or there it doesn't what that actually doesn't matter what what this is part of the the simulation as it were of the simulacrum yeah, if yeah. you like after the collapse um, there's some sort of impasse or embarrassment about what to do with the tradition. So let's just problematize all of it. Uh, or as analytical philosophy tried in the beginning, let's just think history doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but instead, the it, it, we have to take seriously, it has collapsed. We have to see also its merits, however. Yes. And at the same time, because it, it has, it, it is, it comes almost naturally, you know, yes. it used to be that we spoke of the metaphysical birthright of the human being, uh, which is, to say we're born in this dimension also but yeah, that yeah. dimension doesn't speak to us anymore i don't think it does we, we try to replicate it uh, technologically perhaps also but what we have to uh, what we have to what we could might perhaps uh, uh, get to or allow ourselves to well to open us up towards is um is the the, the reading the tradition again in such a way that it it it, it's it's not pure intellect academic interest but it is genuinely let's say transformative yeah and yeah. And, and and transformative in a way that it it you, you can see it almost uh spreading as it were you can and yeah. It, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. i mean it, it's this is what i'm you know philosophy is real that's what I'm, you know what i mean by this it's not yeah. it's not plato had a weird thought and who cares? Yeah. Uh, but th no, th these thoughts carry the world in some sense. They 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 yeah. make up. Yeah. You yeah. if you've never heard of Descartes, doesn't matter. You still live in a Cartesian world. Yes. Yes. And, yes. And pro probably Descartes never read Parmenides. He still rearticulated the fundamental principle of Western philosophy, which is identity of being and thinking. Yes. Yeah. So it, that's the funny, the weird thing about thinking is you don't have to have read everything. You still live in this world. Yeah. So let's, we, yeah. <laughs> Hence, we have to find our own way, answer. So my friend, I, I'm going to need to bring yeah. this to, to a close. Um, yeah. I thought this was tremendously um, rich. Um, um, I thought we made it progress isn't quite the right word but there was there was a lot that was unfolded that and it and, and it and it kept weaving together and it uh, but i just want to give you uh, like i do with all the guests on my channel uh, the opportunity to make the last word it doesn't have to be summative or cumulative but just your last word thank you thank you very much john that that should be it. and thank you everyone for listening Thank you so much, my friend. We'll be in touch. We'll 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 be in touch, and we'll be in talk. Yeah, yeah. Again and again.